Hello. So as I said, I have been maintaining OpenStack since it existed in 2001. Uh, it's a, this is a piece of, of software to package in Debian. I was surprised uh, on the bits from the DPL to find out I was one of the, the fifth uploader last year. Uh, and I've, I've been doing um, hosting uh, uh, for a long time, and I currently work for Op Infomaniac, which is a gold sponsor of the event, and it's also uh, the first hosting company in Switzerland. So, uh, thi this, uh, this talk is uh, kind of an answer I'm doing to uh, what I've been hearing from the FSF. So I hope, even if John Sullivan is not here in the room, that I'm, uh, I'll be heard. And so uh, it addresses to everyone that potentially needs hosting because there's a trend of going to the cloud and I'll explain why this is happening. So there's multiple types of clouds. There's infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service. I'm on, on this talk, I'm not going to address software as a service. I just hope to lift uh, the confusion that there is currently about that. So this is all about uh, having on-demand VMs on, on, on from a service provider. Uh, like most of us in the room and in Debian in general, I also believe that we should never use software as a service because you are not in the control of the software you're using then. Nevertheless, we still need uh, hosting services for all sorts of types of services like ticketing, shops, banking, news content, Wikimedia, or, or gaming, whatnot. So, pe people have been using uh, dedicated servers and shared hosting for a long, long time, and then Slowly, it's shifting to what we call infrastructure as a service for multiple reasons. Uh, one of them is uh, cost control because uh, as time passes, uh, using the cloud is getting cheaper and cheaper. And your s services can grow in an infrastructure as a service provider as your service is growing. and. If you are smart enough, you can even do auto-scaling, meaning that uh, you will automatically do provisioning of VMs inside the infrastructure as a service whenever there is more demand on your uh, web server, for example. But that's not it. Uh, people start using the cloud because um, setting up the traditional way on dedicated server just takes too long and it's too complicated. Like you would install uh, the operating system with uh, the Debian installer manually uh, using a KVM and then uh, Apache and then all your services one by one. That That's too slow to do it and that's not the way people are doing these days. Uh, I've, I've met uh, a company which is called uh, Scale 5 in Paris, in Champs-Elysees. They do only infrastructure as code. So what, what does that mean? It means that to be able to do a deployment, they do um, they write scripts using Terraform. So Terraform will do the provisioning of your VMs. Uh, and then it all deploys automatically. And anything they have to do on their virtual infrastructure is implemented through programming. And uh, so you would use something like Terraform first that would maybe uh, create your inv inventory file and then it will uh, go to, um, th then later on you can use either Puppet or Ansible. And it will most of the time leverage um, more uh, advanced service like Database as a service, DNS as a service, 
uh, load balancing as a service so that you don't need to implement it on your own deployment. You just use whatever the, the provider is giving to you. So more and more companies are switching to that kind of model to deploy um, hosted services. And it's becoming the only scalable way to do things. Yet, um, at the FSF, I, I saw um, Richard Stallman joining the Debian Cloud list um, uh, back in 2013, so you see that that's a long time ago. And he wrote, uh, please do not talk about cloud. So his idea is that just saying cloud is too much of a general term to describe something, and we would better use more specific terms. So, okay, I, I can somehow agree with that. And yet, that's the campaign from the FSA, FSFE. So, uh, what cloud are they talking about here? Is it software as a service? We don't know, right? Are they talking about um, proprietary clouds like AWS? We don't know either, it's just general, it's cloud. So it's exactly what Richard Stallman has been saying to us, that we should not use the cloud, and then they use it for the campaign. And uh, so uh, on top of that, so like uh, the word cloud computing comes from infrastructure as a service, and then people have been, have been saying, uh, I'm putting something in the cloud. That's because we do have infrastructure as a service and software on top of that, that we say that. So the word cloud does have meaning and, and we should take care how to use it, I agree. But we should not just dismiss cloud and say that it's a bad thing in general. Anyway, this will not work. Like People are going to continue to use the cloud because, as I said previously, that's an efficient way to... Uh, to go online. Um, and then I have a slide uh, I heard. So I listened to uh, Benjamin, Benjamin uh, Marco Hill, sorry, I'm not saying it the right way, and uh, having his talk at Libre Planet. And uh, I was a bit shocked by his message. So I'm, I'm going to uh, make you listen to it. It's going to be a little bit tricky because I have no sound on my, on my computer, so I use my phone and the computer at the same time. Of big new successful projects are either software, phones, and embedded systems, things like Android, or lots of things that are sort of cloud services based. You can think of OpenStack or Kubernetes or databases, web frameworks, so on and so forth. And the reason those two things have me worried is because although these are free software and they're even peer, peer production in the sense that there is peer production happening around these things, maybe less than was the case in Linux in the mid 90s, but, um, but, but it's definitely happening. They're both driven by, by firms who are engaging in a kind of strategic openness that, that involves the software being released freely and even distributed freely. But in both cases, it's companies that are developing and deploying software uh, the, where the companies who are developing and deploying the software get the freedom, and the users, the end users, do not. And in the case of web services, you know, software is not even running on your computer. And we, RMS talked about this yesterday, right? Like, the software runs on someone else's computer. They have the freedom to change it and to pull in things, but the users of that web service have nothing, or very, or very little. Not better that they would be proprietary. For this, for certainly for the sake of the companies that are building them, the phone manufacturers, they have all the freedoms that we care about. But I think we need to recognize as a community that the users of both systems are almost universally and totally unfree. And they're doing it in ways that provide freedom and uh, benefits and freedom to themselves, but not their users. So that's Sorry, a little bit technical issue here did that to me over and over. All right, so 
uh, I listened to that and I was shocked because I spent like maybe one third of my professional career uh, fighting for the cloud to become free and available to everyone. And they are just saying that we should not use it. That that's not ever going to happen ever. Like and um, on top of that, uh, the question is not uh, whether or not if you you are running the cloud, it's okay. You could be renting a small VM. You could be renting a one new server. You could be owning that server, putting it in a rack, and then just doing collocation. You can own the rack and its switches, or the data center, or even the power grid and production. It can go on and on and on. Yes, of course, you do have more freedom when you own all these things. But this is not about it. The question is whether or not you control the software that, that is powering your deployment online, right? And using non-proprietary -pro uh, software is what is removing uh, f freedom, uh, I, at least I think so. So uh, owning or leasing the, 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 the hosting infrastructure is just a question about managing your own costs. Uh, having a, a VM, a private cloud or a public cloud is also about managing your costs. The important thing is what do you run on it and do you have the full control over it? I believe in that way that uh, the, the FSF communication message is wrong and that they should uh, aim at uh, people not to use the proprietary uh, clouds like Amazon, Google, uh, and Azure or uh, uh, DigitalOcean, because these are all, all proprietary solutions, even though you can run Debian on, on it. So, um, what you should aim at, so uh, it's a bit redundant, so what you should aim at uh, is avoiding vendor locking and being able to switch providers. Uh, switching providers means that you have an open framework to do so and uh, that you are able to use the same API to go from one provider to another and that is what OpenStack is all about. The important thing is uh, interoperability, if I can s succeed in pronouncing it. Um, so that's what you see here on the screen is the OpenStack manifesto. So um, uh, I will I will say it aloud loud for you. So OpenStack is a reliable cloud infrastructure uh, with the mission to be ubiquitous and to produce um, public and private cloud regardless of size, and it it needs to be uh, massively scalable. So. The important thing here is ubiquitous so, uh, in, in terms of uh, freedom because this way you can go from one provider to another. Uh, so the key is in interop interoperability. The, the OpenStack clients are tested to be always backward compatible, meaning that you can use the latest version of the OpenStack client and still uh, go to host on a service provider that is using a very old version of OpenStack. It, this will continue to work. Um, the other thing, a, the other meaning of that manifesto is that you are able to implement OpenStack by yourself and ins install it on-prem. So uh, you set up your own computers with OpenStack. So that's at least the theory, right? Uh, the other thing is that with OpenStack, you also do have all the features that are on the proprietary solutions. You have an encrypted volume, auto scaling, uh, DNS as a service, DB as a service, and whatnot. Uh, we used to say uh, as a joke that OpenStack is project as a service because it's so rich in, in features. So. 
Also, the API is very clean. And uh, if you compare it to the AWS API, uh, I, I like it way more. Uh, if you look at some, some of the tools from Google, it's just scary. So uh, in terms of just quality of the product, I think it's really comparable. And also, you do have 12 region for Amazon. Uh, for OpenStack providers, you have 18 of them. Uh, spread across 50 regions. Uh, these are only the companies that uh, registered into the OpenStack marketplace. So if you go to openstack.org, you click on marketplace, public cloud, and then you, s you see this map. So f for sure, you will find a service provider that is next to you or next to your customer. And then the next question is, why should you s use OpenStack and on Debian and not on other distributions? So uh, other um, vendors are trying to sell a product to you. Uh, most of the time, they want also to sell some uh, services around it. Um, th the only operating system where I uh, it's not the case, it's Debian. Um, also, uh, I have to explain uh, the Ubuntu tra trademark thing. So on my, my previous employer was uh, Birantis. Birantis had this solution uh, for setting up OpenStack uh, using a, a DVD that used to contain all the packages from, from Ubuntu. So they were able to do that because they had the Ubuntu license. But as you may know, um, Ubuntu, even though is uh, free software, has a trademark issue which is uh, on purpose blurred, and especially for OpenStack, meaning that if you want to make a derivative without asking canonical, then you have to remove everything that is related to Ubuntu, tra Ubuntu trademark. For example, uh, you need to recompile every packages, and um, if you see Ubuntu even on a changelog version, you have to remove the word Ubuntu. So therefore, my, my, my previous employer had to remove all the Ubuntu packages from the DVD distribution. So uh, there is no problem to do derivative on Debian, including with all the OpenStack packages. Uh, and uh, I believe that's also part of, of not being vendor locked in. Because you're not locked in with, with a provider, you could fork Debian and do a derivative if you, if you don't like uh, what we're doing. The other thing is, um, wh when I say Debian packages are always on the edge, it means that we get the dates first. Uh, there's the biggest number of package services inside inside OpenStack. It has always been the case, and I've been uh, trying to do so to always have one or more services than than what you saw on other distributions. And um, the other thing is because of, of uploading to Seed, then we also get um, updates from uh, dependencies earlier than other distributions. So uh, even though I, I maintain uh, unofficial uh, Debian backports on, on Debian.net uh, domain name, the work is still done in SID, and like uh, uh, the upgrade happens there. So th currently there's some Python 3.7 uh, upgrades that needs to happen. So if you are a uh, Python developer, uh, Debian is also a good choice. And then there's the question of deploying OpenStack, right? So everybody knows that famously OpenStack isn't easy to deploy. So uh, uh, since I started doing the, this packaging, I've tried to make it as easy as possible. Uh, the first thing was made with DebConf screens, so that uh, you could just have easy questions to answer. 
to set up your DB access to uh, RabbitMQ messaging and these kind of things. And then uh, providing a, a preceding library so that you can do just call a, a small uh, shell script function to do the preceding. So that has been available for a few years. Uh, since uh, maybe stretch, um, these screens aren't bothering at all any configuration man management tool anymore. Uh, it's, it's safe and tested. And the other thing which is a lot more recent is uh, Puppet. So uh, as you may know there's that Puppet OpenStack um, uh, upstream software that uh, deploys OpenStack for Red Hat and uh, Ubuntu. Uh, so I started in the beginning of spring to patch it to understand Debian. And now it's fully upstreamed, meaning that uh, there is gating on upstream CI to make sure that uh, you can install OpenStack using Debian packages. And uh, hopefully it won't break because uh, of this CI. Uh, so if you want to have a bigger scale, uh, you, you, can, you can use these Puppet packages. Yeah, b packages because um, these Puppet modules I also package them in order to create a bigger software, which uh, hopefully I will have time to explain. So as I said uh, earlier, the other advantage is that Debian is fully free and uh, unlike uh, what you get from other distributions. Um, my, my last, another thing which I want Another message I want to pass on is that if you are in the need of hosting and you decide to use the cloud, then uh, very much you should uh, aim for somebody that uses OpenStack. Because by doing so, you will grow the number of providers and uh, it's going to help the ecosystem. Uh, so, um, my own effort into making the cloud free is working on OpenStack on Debian and making it uh, to, uh, available for everyone and in a way so that it's easy to, uh, to use and deploy. Uh, so, I'm I'm trying to make it uh, OpenStack. I'm, uh, so my my goal is that OpenStack on Debian is the best solution uh, for uh, on-prem clouds. I hope one day we will have uh, bike sheds, so that uh, it could be backports could be shipped into a, um, a more official way than Debian.net domain. The other thing is Puppet OpenStack that I worked on, and the last thing is the glue between all of that, which is OpenStack uh, Cloud Installer, which I'm currently working on. So the, sh and so the short name would be OCI. So um, I'm, I'm not going to do a full demonstration of it, but uh, because that's probably not, not very useful, I, I, I think it's best that I just explain what it does. So uh, what you see here is a uh, VM, but it, because I use it for my development, but it could as, as well run on bare metal. So that VM does uh, DHCP, PXE, uh, and so on, so that you can uh, um, network boot uh, VMs. Uh, these VMs are uh, booting onto a uh, Debian live system produced with uh, live build. Inside that live image, uh, there's an agent uh, which is very, very tiny, like written in, in shell script, that reports back to that uh, server that you see here. 
and um, so that the, the, the bare metal machines can report uh, what, what their characteristics are. So how much memory, how much hard drive, what's the interfaces, their MAC address and speed and so on, okay? So then after that you, have, you do have a list of uh, VMs that are booted uh, over DHCP and their serial numbers. So once you've uh, got a few machines, then you can start your deployment. To do that, you, you got to define um, networks. So uh, you can define one, uh, I don't know, one for volume, okay? Uh, assign it an IP address. Then you have roles for your machines that you can uh, you can add some custom ones. These are the defaults. And then finally, you define your clusters. So here, there's uh, one uh, cluster which I already uh, uh, made. And when you when you click on it uh, on that already existing cluster, then you see, you see a bit more. So. Um, it's it's not very nice because the resolution is a little bit too small. I'm sorry for that. So at the bottom you see uh, available machines, which you s also saw on the first screen, that you can add to your cluster, and then uh, they are uh, numbered automatically. And according to the network I've added to the cluster, then uh, the IPs are added auto automatically as well. And then here you see the virtual IP for the for the cluster, so that you can share uh, one IP uh, in a HA mode uh, on on these two machines. So this this is just to uh, define roles and IPs for the machines. Uh, there is no big uh, install the cluster button, but uh, that's uh, I will add it some someday. In the meantime, you can just click the ins install button. So what's going to happen when, when you click the install button? So uh, first, it's going to uh, create some Puppet certificate uh, into the this uh, DHCP uh, PXE uh, server and copy it into the live system so that it's ready for uh, installation then it's going to run uh, OpenStack Debian images to um, install on, on bare metal a system using uh, the bootstrap and whatnot. And uh, once that's done, this, the, the server will reboot. It will already be prepared for Puppet. It has a role, and then when it boots up, then it, a Puppet agent will contact this server um, and this server has an ENC for the people who knows a Puppet. That's an external node classifier. So that the server will be able to tell uh, Puppet agent uh, what services to install. So that's where I'm up to right now. I have uh, the packages, I have Puppet, I have this bare metal installer. And uh, now what's missing is composing the services, but uh, I think that's f fairly easy compared to the rest of the work that I've done already on this. So hopefully this will be ready for Buster so that we have a point and click installer for OpenStack. Uh, I think that's it. So this was my presentation. I'm open for uh, questions. So yeah, uh, so finally, um, before I end, uh, so this software and all I've been doing over the last uh, seven years is my way to fight against proprietary cloud software. And uh, so, which is why I wanted to, to do this talk is because I was very frustrated about the way the FSF was doing things. And uh, I found it uh, very frustrating to, to invest so much work to do uh, uh, to try to liberate the cloud and having the FSF be doing a very counterproductive uh, message. Okay, thank you.
Is there, is there any question? Oh, yeah, there's only one mic. So is this software that you just presented available in Debian or is it in the new queue? Like, I mean, this solution that you just showed uh, in the browser. Kind of, you have a version in Debian which is one month old, uh, but it's in Salsa, okay? You, so you can build it if you want. It comes together with a, uh, so this is, um, uh, yeah, the other thing is it's very ugly right now, so you please don't pay attention to the GUI. I will probably uh, give it to some designers. Okay, I'm not I'm not a GUI guy. Uh, uh, it it comes with a uh, package which is called OpenStack uh, Cluster Installer dash POC like POC. So you can install the the POC package in your uh, bare metal machine and then it spawns some VMs. So that's that's the way I do my development. So if you want to participate to it, then uh, you, you can just use the POC and then it's very easy to set up. The only thing is that it's quite demanding in terms of uh, resources. Uh, so I have a 128 gig uh, of RAM server to, to run that. Probably you could downsize it. Uh, I'm not sure that UI will be the most uh, important thing, especially as something like this to, to start machines will be used yeah. more by technical Th that's people. That's the other thing. Uh, it comes also with an API. Ah. So um, uh, you can you can uh, push machines into the cluster. So in, in fact, everything you saw there, you can, you can do it with API. Okay, it's kind of not really a REST API because uh, it's not uh, uh, REST addresses, yeah. but like with parameters. <laughs> cool, thanks. Uh, uh, Red Hat and the CentOS supports several uh, OpenStack releases in, uh, in one uh, CentOS vo version. Uh, is there a way to achieve this in Debian? Uh, so we do have backports of every OpenStack release uh, to the whatever is the current release. So. Uh, there's uh, what Mitaka, uh, Newton, uh, Pike, uh, whatever available. The main concern is about uh, the uh, user to upgrade their uh, OpenStack version, and uh, uh, when the new uh, Debian stable release, the, uh, and they how to, uh, for example, jump to uh, new. Release and, uh, so yeah, uh, with, with OpenStack, you cannot upgrade from one version to another because yeah. uh, the DB migration script imports the code of, uh, of whatever service we are talking about. So you can only uh, jump from one version to the next. Uh, because I'm, I've, I've used a Puppet OpenStack, normally upgrades are supported. Uh, I'm not planning on managing upgrades on my software. So uh, if you want to do it, uh, to do the upgrades, you will probably need to do some uh, manual puppet tweaking stuff. Yeah. I'm not sure yet. Okay. Anyone else? Have you took the idea of make a pure blend of something like open cloud pure blend from Debian? Uh, so uh, what I'm looking forward to have is uh, the bike sheds, you know, the Debian uh, way to do PPAs. And uh, I'd better have that than just a pure blend. I'm not sure a pure blend would be useful because, uh, I mean, pure blends are to be able to install, uh, uh, s like, I don't know, Debian EDU with the uh, DI, right? You could do that with OpenStack, but I'm not sure it would make sense because uh, what you want to do is be able to deploy a full cluster automatically. You don't really want to do it by hand.
do you do you think that uh, when uh, this uh, will be released uh, it would be uh, easier to set up uh, an OpenStack uh, environment because that now OpenStack is very is very complicated and uh, Ubuntu sells uh, property uh, solutions because uh, paying it's more simple to do uh, but for a smaller uh, uh, stacks and uh, now it's uh, quite difficult to, to, to set up uh, an open stack solution. So that's very much my goal. Do, um, what I aim with, with this software is to be able to address uh, uh, people willing to do a quick deployment uh, on-prem, probably uh, to test and try open stack. I'm not sure it's, uh, how can I say? If you want to have uh, fully uh, working OpenStack for a long time, you also need the knowledge, right? If you're not capable of, of, of setting it up uh, by hand yourself, probably you also won't be able to maintain it, okay? Uh, having a software to do just an install is super cool so that you can have automation to do the installation. Uh, it's nice to have it for people who are newbies and just want to try trade at home but it doesn't replace knowledge uh, two questions the first one is uh, which framework or language is using OCI like is Python PHP Perl? yeah that, that's written in PHP yes okay and the second is why not like reuse triple O triple O <laughs> Uh, so, um, I've tried to make it as small and easy to maintain as possible, which I don't think fits at all the definition of Triple O. <laughs> it's like uh, Triple O is made by 80 engineers, yeah. and they still have lots of trouble. Yeah, okay. Uh, it makes sense when you say this is for like smaller clouds. Okay. Uh, I hope I hope to use it in my in in Orphomaniac, like for our for our uh, deployments. I'm, I'm not sure what we can call small, like uh, we're having a uh, few hundred nodes. Okay, thanks. <laughs> like OpenStack becomes very tricky after this type of scales, right? Could you go to that slide that showed the benefits of Debian not having the vendor lock-in and those kinds of points? Sure. I'm not sure what it is. Let yeah. me find it out. Ah, so something. So it's one of those in there. Uh, it's vendor lock-in, yes. So I was thinking about the way you're framing this as a, your concern about the way the FSF was criticizing cloud. And yeah, so what, I, let me let me explain yeah, sure. my point of it. Uh, seems like. There are two different kinds of problems. Like, there is a problem that the masses of the world are locked into as clients of servers they have no control over, and their data has, is not in their control, and their access is not in their control, and these kinds of issues. Uh, and so that's the, I see that as the criticism about the cloud. And it also applies to administrators. You know, do you have control over your machines that you're providing for your clients? It's precisely what my, my talk is about, yes. Yeah, so uh, it seems like I think the FSF criticism is still valid and true. And I hear what you're saying is, yes, okay, let's make it, if we're going to have a cloud, let's do it right. Rather exactly, than, yeah, and yeah. their message is blurred, yeah. saying that it's just cloud, and they are not saying, Please choose the correct cloud, which is what I believe they should say. Yeah, I th it's important to parse out those different parts of it, rather than just thinking of it as 
you're saying FSF is wrong, it's more like, okay, we do have a cloud, how do we do it right? I'm 100% with them, in fact. Yeah. And, and I just think they are doing a counterproductive message. Mm. Any, anyone else? All right, thank you then.